água sim, pela água sim, calava sim, abraço assim, beijinho assim. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's Noir at the Bar Online, a virtual evening filled with jazz, cocktails, and most importantly, readings by some of your favorite noir authors. My name is Caitlin and I'll be your host for the evening. I'd love for you to tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. Firstly, I want to thank Randy and Haley Moon, the two organizers for tonight's event. We're bringing their vision to life, an evening featuring prominent and up-and-coming noir fiction authors reading selections from their works for people all over the world. Thanks so much for having this vision, Randy and Haley. I have to find my spotlight. Here we go. All right. We're excited to have Trident Booksellers and Cafe in Boston, Massachusetts as our sponsor for this evening. They've graciously agreed to give a free tote with purchases of $25 or more to our attendees who purchase with the code NOIR. I'll drop that link in the chat in just a minute, as well as that promo code. Our authors and vocalists have agreed to donate copies of their works to some of our lucky guests. You'll have different opportunities to win throughout the evening. If your name is picked out of the hat during the raffle, I'll send you a link with a form to fill out to claim your prize. Tonight, each of our amazing authors will be reading excerpts from a recent novel of theirs, and we also have a special musical guest, singer Sarah Jones, who will be sharing some evocative jazz vocals throughout the evening. A quick note that Lisa Regan and Lauren Bukes will unfortunately not be able to join us this evening, but we have a great lineup of authors for you, and you'll definitely see them at future Noir at the Bar online events. A few housekeeping items. If you're having any difficulties with Zoom, please use the chat feature to address me privately and I'll be happy to help you resolve them. To send a private chat, you can use the drop down in the chat window to choose my name, or if you hover over my name, Caitlin, in the participants panel, choose more and then chat, you can send me a private message that way as well. Please start your chat requests with help in all caps so that I can clearly see it and help you when you need it. Tonight's program will be recorded for future viewing. If you'd like updates on future events, you can join our Facebook group and I'll put that link in the chat in just a minute as well. And with that, we'll get going. Starting off our program this evening is our mixologist Nathan Ford of Old Fashioned Events. Nathan, also known as Nudge, is no stranger to the bartending and entertainment industry. His career as a barman started in Southeast Queensland and quickly saw him fly across the world to India. He was the bar manager who headed up the opening of Antares alongside master chef Sarah Todd. Many articles have been written on the quality of the drinks he provides, thanks to his love for cocktails, high-class service, and the ability to wow customers. Nudge is obsessed with perfecting cocktails and always brings his creative side when designing new ones. He's currently the owner and head bartender of Old Fashioned Events, a mobile whiskey bar that captures, oh, that captivates customers and gives them the full whiskey experience. And with that, I will hand it over to Nathan in just two seconds. Ask to unmute. There you go. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? All right. Hey guys, welcome um, all the way from the other side of the world here in Queensland. I'm um, going to make a special cocktail for everyone tonight, one of my favourite cocktails, but we're going to do a little twist on it. And we're going to look at Negroni, which is basically a Italian cocktail that was founded, well, legend says that it was founded around in uh, 1919 by Count Negroni, who had a bartender as a friend. Uh, his favorite drink was an Americano, which incorporates sweet vermouth, Campari, and soda. And the story goes that he wanted to strengthen that drink and asked his bartender friend to add some gin into it. And that's when the Negroni was born. So tonight we're going to do a little twist. Um, I'm going to add a couple of ingredients in there and, and flavor that one up a little bit. If you ever want to make this one at home, all you need is something to mix your ingredients in. So just any sort of glass, um, just a spoon, something to measure with, um, and three ingredients. So Campari, sweet vermouth, and the gin. So 
Tonight, we're going to do a uh, pink grapefruit one for you with a little dash of coffee on top. So this is a great uh, sipping cocktail that you can sit on for a little, uh, a long time. So probably great to uh, sit around and read a book after dinner because it's an aperitif and it'll break down that food that you've just had. Um, so let's get uh, into the drink. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take 30 mils, so it's all equal parts. So we're going to do 30 mils of the sweet vermouth. Do 30 mils of our Campari. I'm using uh, Whitley Neal pink grapefruit gin. So we're going to do 30 mils of the pink grapefruit gin. like that and all you need to do there is just grab some ice cubes that you've got at home probably just a handful of the ice cubes Pop those into the mixing glass and you just want to stir it down what we want to do is basically just chill the liquid um, and we want to just dilute it slightly as well so probably for around 30 seconds or so is probably where you sort of want to stir that drink down to. Let's just give it a little bit of a taste. Yep, perfect. Then what we're going to do is just get a fresh glass. So just a short rocks glass is perfect for a Negroni. And then if you've got, um, I've got these trays that you can get just at your local store and they just have like a larger ice cube in it. And what we do is just put Two of those into there like that. And what we're going to do is strain it over the top of that fresh ice. One out of the way. Piece of uh, pink grapefruit for this one. We're just going to slide that in. Typically, it would be an orange if we were doing a classic Negroni. And then what I really like on top of my Negroni is just to top it off works really well is just some cold brew coffee and we're just going to lie a little bit of that on top. And there you have it. Pink grapefruit Negroni. A little bit of coffee on top to keep you up so you can enjoy it. So I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, looking forward to uh, yeah, listening to everybody else and um, I hope everyone has a, a great Friday night uh, and thank you very much for having me from the other side of the world to, to show you uh, a beautiful drink. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nathan. No that worries. looks delicious. I want one now. I'll try it. <laughs> Perfect. Alrighty. So our first author taking the stage is Jordan Harper. Jordan Harper lives in Los Angeles, where he works as a TV writer, most recently on the show Hightown on Stars. He's the author of the short story collection Love and Other Wounds and the Edgar Award winning novel She Rides Shotgun, which he's currently adapting into a film. His upcoming novel includes The Last King of California to be published in the UK in 2022 and Everybody Knows to be published in the US in 2023 by Mulholland. Tonight for Noir at the Bar Online, he'll debut a reading from his newest novel, Everybody Knows. Let's grab him up on the screen. There you go, Jordan. Okay, great. Just start this. This is going to be the first chapter of Everybody Knows, or at least a selection of it. So Everybody Knows, Chapter 1, May, The Chateau. Los Angeles burns. Some sicko is torching homeless camps. Tonight they hit a tent city in Los Files near the Five. The fire spread to Griffith Park. The smoke makes the sunset unbelievable. The particles in the air slash the light, shift it red. They make the sky a neon wound. May waits outside the secret entrance to Chateau Marmont. She watches Saturday night tourists wander Sunset Boulevard, their eyes bloodshot from the smoke. They cough, they trade looks. They never thought the Sunset Strip would smell like a campfire. 
May moves around the sidewalk like a boxer before the fight. Her face is sharp and bookish, framed in a Lulu bob. She wears a vintage floral jumpsuit. She's got eyes like a wolf on the hunt. She hides them behind chunky oversized glasses. Nobody ever sees her coming. Dan's text had read Hannah Chateau ASAP, followed by the number for Hannah Hurd's new assistant. Dan's crypt, the text was cryptic per usual. The rules say keep as much as possible unsaid. The Chateau Marmont is the hippest no-tell hotel in the world. This shabby chic Gothic castle slouching against the base of the Hollywood Hills. The secret entrance on sunset leads straight to the grotto where the private cottages are. The unmarked door built into the white brick wall is made of green cloth. Someone could slash it easily and go marauding among the rich and famous, but no one ever does. Chateau jobs tend to be messy. They tend to be drama. They tend to be a fucking blast. Hannah Heard increases the odds of all three exponential exponentially. The green cloth door swings open. The girl on the other side is early 20s. She's got blue hair and an Alaska Thunderfuck t-shirt worn as a dress. Her vibe is manic pixie e-girl. Her eyes are wide like a rabbit in a trap. Meg, uh, May pegs her as having a milk brief life in the industry. It's not that the girl feels fear, it's that she lets it show. The rules say, wear your mask tight. I'm Hannah's assistant, Shira. She swallows her voice before it can make it all the way out of her mouth. You're the publicist? Something like that. Take me to her. In the grotto, everything is Xanax soft. The hooting of the strip fades away. Even the smoke stench from the wildfires is blotted somehow. Everything rustles dreamlike, all bougainvillea and bamboo in art deco stained glass. On each side of the grotto sit six little cottages. There is a brick lagoon at the center of it, still and tranquil, full of water lilies and mossy stones. One thing breaks the dream. The concrete Buddha at the foot of the lagoon is spilled on his side and the fall decapitated him. His severed head smiles up at the sky. May figures it must have just happened. The chateau is pretty good about hiding bodies. Shira sees May looking at the toppled god. She says, she had a long flight. The girl knows how to say things without saying them. Maybe she'll make it here after all. Hannah's cottage smells like an industrial dump site. The ammonia bite of whatever they've been smoking makes May's eyes tear up. She turns to the assistant before she can close the door behind them. Leave it open. The smell, nobody cares. The cottage's front room is beyond trashed. Clothes and piles tumble out of Gucci luggage, this crazy mix of couture and sweatpants. Room service trays and empty bottles crowd every surface. A plate of fries jellied in ketchup. Kombucha bottles turn into ashtrays. A tray of Dom Perignon and Cool Ranch Doritos. On the table, a baggie of something yellow-white like chunks of bone sit next to a well-used glass pipe. May looks down. She's kicking rock-hard dog turds. It must have taken weeks to do this damage, but the assistant said Hannah just flew in. Hannah's running a tab when she's not even in town and the cottages go for a grand a night. Two men and a woman slouch on the vintage couch like throw pillows. Lifestyle and face fillers have turned them into triplets. May knows the type, remoras, fish that eat the trash off the body of a shark. They take in May with blank fishy eyes. In comes the one and only Hannah Heard. You know her face. Even with her hoodie pulled up and the oversized glasses, you know it. The knowing floats in the air like wildfire smoke. Even if you didn't catch all six seasons of her on As If or her tween crap movies, you saw her thirst trap Vanity Fair cover the month she turned 18, or in the past few years, you saw the lost roles and the flops, or you saw the tabloid shit, the stuff May and Dan couldn't kill as she spiraled into some sort of slow motion car crash of the soul. Red, red wine stains on her orange Celine hoodie. That's another thousand down the drain, but it's the sunglasses that May's thinking about. Hannah is wearing two big sunglasses in a too dark room. The job is under those glasses. Hannah's voice comes out chopped and screwed. Hey, bitch, you look absolutely gorge. You mean like big and empty? Hannah doesn't get it. They fake kiss hello. The sweat coming out of Hannah has a paint thinner tang. Her body is pumping out toxins any way it can. The hug turns heavy, Hannah leaning into her, begging May to take her weight. May holds her up the best she can. This is May, Hannah says to the triplets. She's a goddamn killer. Hannah, May says, pitching her voice just right, 
threaded with care and compassion, enough to comfort Hannah, not so much that she feels the condescension. The rules say, handle the client. Why don't you take your sunglasses off and tell me why I'm here? Hannah takes off her glasses. Her left eye is purple and swollen like a split plum. May keeps the mask on tight. Her face doesn't flicker. The rules say, keep it to yourself. She turns to She-Ra again. What's her call time? She's got makeup at 4 a.m. Shit. According to the story, the one cooked up by Hannah's team, Hannah's been rehabbing her life these past six months. The publicist set up redemption arc interviews with friendlies at the Big Glossies. The story did its job. Tomorrow, she starts filming on an Oscar bait indie drama. It's not the lead, but it's a good part. If all goes well, the story can enter its second act. Pop actress proves she's got chops. Her eye ruins everything. The movie people will go apeshit when they see her eye. If Hannah's eye kills her first day, if they see it as a symptom of her being terminally fucked, the producers will fire her and bring in whatever next year's model actress they sure as hell already have waiting in the wings. May knows that in the industry, if a man falls off a cliff, maybe he can climb back up. People will even stick their hands over the sides to yank him to safety. But once a woman falls, she's fallen for good. If she's clinging to the edge, folks might just stomp on her fingers just for the love of the game. Hannah loses the movie and she drops into the void. The rules say, protect the client, even from themselves. And then you're gonna find out how she got the black eye. So um, that's it, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Awesome, thanks so much. All righty, let me just pop me up there. Cool, so next up is Nicole Lundergan. Nicole is the author of several critically acclaimed novels, including Hideaway, which was shortlisted for the Arthur Ellis Award for Best Crime Novel, The Substitute, and Glass Boys. Her work has appeared on Best of Selections from The Globe and Mail, Amazon, Chatelaine, Now Magazine, and others. She grew up in a small community on the island of Newfoundland and currently resides in Toronto, Canada. Tonight, Nicole will be reading from her upcoming novel, An Unthinkable Thing. It's a stylish mid-century thriller that follows the shocking 1958 trial of an 11-year-old boy accused of killing his housekeeper mother's wealthy employers. As the court drama unfolds, the disturbing events leading up to that deadly summer's afternoon are revealed. An Unthinkable Thing will be available in April 2022. And with that, I'll put Nicole up on the screen. Hi everyone, um, I'm going to jump right in with the prologue and this is told from the perspective of an adult. Um, when I was a young boy, my aunt often told me a lie makes things worse, but she never explained that the truth can too. I learned that lesson on my own during the summer of 1958 when I was 11 years old. Before that, I'd had a fairly regular childhood I was raised by my aunt Celia and we lived in a small walk-up apartment on a pothole street in Lower Washburn. Like most of our neighbors, we didn't have much, but we managed. A nice old couple named Mr. and Mrs. King lived directly below us and my best friend Wally was in the building across the street. When it was warm, Wally and I would bike to the lake to hunt frogs or catch fish and children were always outside skipping rope and playing kick the can. School was decent too. My teacher, Mrs. Pinsent, often thought my aunt, often told my aunt I was bright but distracted. Apparently, I had a fondness for daydreaming. But in the weeks before the end of that school year, a shift happened. Not a change I saw or heard, but more something I felt. My easygoing aunt, who'd cared for me every single day since I was born, was different. She'd grown more intense about everything. All at once, she was bothered by the stray cats in the alley and the chips on the rims of our cereal bowls. She began to complain about the looping staircases as we had to climb to reach our apartment. She spoke repeatedly about wanting a house with a fence and a yard. I blamed those changes on the new man she'd been seeing. He was one of her patients from St. Augustine's Hospital where she was a night nurse. I suspected him of making promises he'd never keep. I suspected her of believing them. Even though I hadn't met him, I recall having a damp awareness that he was not a good person. I'd hoped she'd forget about him like she had with all the others 
and everything would return to the way it was before, but it never did. Instead, the worst possible thing occurred, upending my life in ways I could not have fathomed. I was forced to leave our apartment and taken to stay with my birth mother. She was a live-in housekeeper and worked for the Hanaberries, Washburn's wealthiest and most respected family. I soon discovered nobody had a clue who they really were. Three decades have passed since that hot afternoon when the Hanaberries, mother, father, and son were murdered. While that may seem like enough time for the memories to dull, occasionally I wake up during the night and I'm still there, standing on that manicured lawn. The gun is going off once, twice, three times. My shirt is sprayed with their blood and my tongue tastes of metal. When I look up, my mother is beside me. Her maid's uniform has a red smear across the line of buttons. She grips my arm. Thomas, listen to me. I can't meet her eyes. Then comes the slow crunch of tires over the gravel driveway. The doctor has arrived, but the dozen, dozens of pill bottles he carries in his black bag can't change what has already happened. Hurry, my mother cries. She's yanking off my soiled clothes. I need to wash your... The car door slams. Even now, I can recall the exact dilemma that swirled through my child's mind. I only have a moment to decide. He is coming toward me. Am I going to tell the truth? Or am I going to be good and brave and tell the lie? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, and this uh, section is still pretty early in the book, but it's told from the perspective of an 11 year old. Same character, just uh, um, the, as um, from the child's perspective. I awoke from a deep sleep in the gray just before sunrise, still on the couch with the blanket over me, George circling around in his bowl. Our apartment felt hollow. I went to the bedroom door and checked the bed. Aunt Celia hadn't come home yet. A warm breeze smelling of garbage came between the curtains. Bottles of milk tinkled, a cat hissed, footsteps then on the sidewalk below. Not my aunt's though, I didn't even need to check. My skin turned to goosebumps and I wasn't sure why, but I had a sick taste in my mouth. Maybe too much birthday cake and I'd forgotten to brush my teeth again. Half the cake was still on the counter, uncovered and drying out. I waited and waited. Gradually the sun came up. I was supposed to be getting ready for school, eating breakfast, rinsing my bowl, putting my pencils and scribblers into my book bag. I went to the kitchen and shook my metal lunchbox. My aunt always made my sandwich when she came home from her shift, but there was nothing inside. Where was she? Part of me was worried and I wondered if I should go tell Mrs. King that my aunt was really late. But another part, a much heavier part, was angry. She was with that man who'd smashed his toe and she'd forgotten all about me. She'd done this twice before and dashed in at the last minute with hasty apologies about working late or getting caught up in conversation with the other nurses, which were lies. I paced around and around the apartment thinking of all the nasty things I'd yell at her when she tried to sneak through that door. From the bedroom window, I watched the road. The street was filling up with kids parents too, men dressed for work, women with baby strollers, everyone going where they needed to go on a Monday morning. Except Mr. Pober, of course. His head was leaning against the railing on the front steps of our apartment building. Some days he stayed that way until noon, snoring and puffing air. There was no sign of my aunt. Wally was coming out of, the, of his building and his sister, Sonny. He noticed me in the window. Hey, Tommy, want me to wait? I crouched down so he couldn't see me anymore. Tommy, he yelled again. Then I heard his mother. We need to get going, Wallace. I'm sure he'll catch up. My stomach grumbled, but I wasn't going to eat a single thing either. I had to feed George though. I walked over to his bowl and when I opened the package of food, he swam to the glass. Only as much as the size of his eye, Aunt Celia had warned me. Otherwise things could get out of control. I really wanted to ask how big his eye was just to make sure, but she still wasn't home. George tapped against the glass. He was probably starving. I sprinkled in some flakes and he darted up to eat. Where was my aunt? I paced some more than the tinny ring of the telephone. It cut through the air and the fright of it made my hands tingle. I picked up the receiver and brought it to my ear, but I didn't say hello. On the other end of the line, someone was breathing in, breathing out, a clacking like a typewriter. I pressed the phone harder against my skull. Miss Ware? 
my hopes deflated. I recognized Mrs. Pinson's voice from school. Recess had come and she must be calling from the office. Thomas is tardy today, Miss Ware. You need to send that boy on his way. Are you there? I laid the receiver down in its cradle. As I sat on the couch, I watched George and then watched the door. My head was getting hot because I was getting angrier and angrier. I got up and pushed the back of a kitchen chair under the doorknob, a clever trick I saw in a movie once. When she finally returned, she'd try her key and she wouldn't be able to open the door. She could knock forever, but she'd have to stay out there in the hallway until I was good and ready. Maybe after a while, she'd begin to cry. She was probably going to be tired from whatever she'd been doing. I bet it was something from that book Wally and I had found in his place, drawings of a naked man lying on top of a naked woman. Mr. Pober would know too, and he'd soon be saying worse stuff. Just before lunchtime, I heard a bunch of footsteps climbing the stairs. The doorknob rattled, and, and that's it. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Nicole. You're welcome. All righty, so our next author is Randy Moon. Randy writes chilling thriller novels under the pseudonym Skylar Randall. He's the author of Jacqueline Willoughby, Raina, and his most recent haunting edition, Francis Lawrence. Randy currently resides in McCalla, Alabama with his wife, Yvette, and their West Highland Terrier, Q. Today, he'll be reading an excerpt from his next book set to be released early 2022, titled the Anemnesis of Dr. Samuel Moore. Let's get Randy up on the screen. Good evening, everyone. It had been many years since Samuel Moore applied his old trade. His time as a contract killer was long behind him. These days, as a mortician, the only bodies he dealt with were those that had already passed by some other twist of fate, not his hand. But when a respected client comes to him with righteous vengeance on her mind, he finds it's time to put his old skills to use once again. And now an excerpt from chapter one. <clears throat> Mr. Hughes was dead, that much was certain. His horizontal form of the mahogany casket indicated that fact clearly. Thick makeup caked to his face, flawlessly hiding the unmistakable parlor of death. His chin and neck had a fresh shave his head a fresh haircut, and what hair remained had been combed and beautifully positioned. The marks of his death were hidden by concealer, a fine suit and a striking red tie, a silk fabric much more pleasant than the streak of blood he had once worn in its place from the gouge across his throat. Mr. Hughes' once lively blue eyes were closed and calm. His lashes were brushed against his cheeks, suggesting an air of sleep and peace peaceful dreams, with no sign of the turmoil he faced in the last few moments of his life. He laid in death almost sweetly, his hands carefully crossed at his chest, ready for the mourners who would attend his funeral with prayer and flowers. The sunlight streamed in over his casket, momentarily resting on his visage, a picturesque angelic sight, dampened only by the haphazard falling of cigar ash onto the cadaver's face. Damn, came a low voice, inhaling smoke. I'm making a mess of my work. The voice belonged to none other than celebrated mortician, Dr. Samuel Moore, who now slowly and deliberately dabbed a cotton round to pick up the ash off his subject's cheek. A decorated alum of Pennsylvania University and owner of the Samuel Moore Funeral Home, Moore had found early on that he had a natural talent for making the dead look lively. Unfortunately, he also had a natural talent for smoking, the desire for which seemed to always come at the most inappropriate times. With over 10 years of experience in his two crafts, he was a veritable, veritable master. And once the subject before him was duly restored, he took a few steps back to admire his work. Mr. Hughes was dead, that much was certain. Now, thanks to Dr. Moore's careful workmanship, he also looked undeniably improved. From several paces back, Samuel paused momentarily at one of the church pews to continue admiring his handiwork. The cigar smoke rose thick into the rafters of the funeral home, dimly lit and somberly still. He pocketed his heavy metal lighter before gazing at the image of Christ on the wall, both graceful and comforting. 
Nothing like a fine cigar and a dead body, Dr. Moore said, smiling. He was both alert and unnerved by the constant scent of death and the strong, sharp smell of formaldehyde that masked it. He felt most alive in the mortuary, a strange sort of knowledge that unsettled him. But a job is a job, and this job was one of grave importance. Dr. Moore was a terrific man to do it. He took pride in his work. There was an unjust nature to death, and Dr. Moore always sought to restore balance to the departed. He cared firmly about justice, about restoring the right order to things. Wasn't there a sort of final justice in allowing the living to see the dead one last time as they were in life? Death was not inevitable. It was guaranteed. But when one would die and how, these are some of life's greatest uncertainties. The undertaker eyed the flowers around the casket, then looked over to the piano. His eyes looked locked on to the hymnal book as he began to sing in a low voice. It may be my last time, I don't know. Just four days earlier, Mr. Hughes was alive. Mrs. Berlusconi had sat in the quiet office, her nails sharp and red, her neck laden thickly with sapphire and diamonds. Her perfectly made up face betrayed a crawling scowl, wrinkling the edges of her cheeks. I want the bastard dead, she said to the figure before her. She was slight, she was old, but she uttered the words with deliberate fortitude. The mortician would normally have laughed at such a request from such a lady, but the gravity in her demeanor gave him pause. Why do you want to take his life? The woman bristled, a slight smirk playing at the edge of her lips. You underestimate me. I know I am old. I know I must seem capable of nothing, but I am a proud Sicilian woman, a woman of honor, and I make this request on behalf of my family, the only people for whom I'd ever raise a blade. The mortician arched an eyebrow. I may seem prim and refined, but I was a hellraiser in my day, Mrs. Berlusconi said. Before all these wrinkles appeared, I took matters into my own hands quite frequently. I even had my weapon of choice, a straight razor gifted to me by my father. Dr. Moore opened his mouth to speak, but the old woman cut him off. I have thought about this decision carefully, and my family and I have suffered enough. Mr. Hughes has cleaned us out entirely. He conned tens of thousands of dollars from my beloved husband and completely wiped out my son's inheritance. We lost the family business trying to recover from his scam, but my son hit and, my, and his children would do nothing. If I do not act now, my ancestral line will lie completely in ruin. Furthermore, I checked his record. We are not his only victims. There will be others. The man spoke at last with an air of curiosity. Why me? The lady looked him up and down. There is no one better suited to the job. You have the intelligence and the tools to take care of both the act and its aftermath. You have the experience. I know of your past, your days at Penn, but most importantly, Dr. Moore, you've been a dear friend to my family over the years. You've cared for them in death as kindly as I care for them in life. I want justice for my family. I want to see the scales balance in our favor. It is all I will ever ask of you. Dr. Moore straightened his tie. I see we both have a past, Mrs. Berlusconi. We are both accustomed to murder and unaccustomed to fear. He placed his steady hand over hers. No charge for this service. He said his voice grave and clear. This time it's on the house. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Randy. All right, everyone, we have reached the portion of the program where we will be doing our first raffle. And we're going to do three names out of the hat, which I will share up on the screen right now. So keep your fingers crossed for your name to come up. First name is Joy Marshall. Congratulations, Joy. I'm sorry, let me just note that down. Alrighty. Next name is 
Oannes Iglesias. Congratulations, Oannes. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Awesome, awesome. And then one more name for now. Winner is Sean Cosby. I will be sending you guys a link to enter your information so we can send you your prizes. Um, but congratulations to you all. And now we'll get back to the regularly scheduled programming. Um, I want everybody to get very excited because next up is award-winning jazz vocalist, Sarah Jones. Jazz vocalist Sarah Jones has performed as a soloist with the National Symphony Orchestra, Cincinnati, Cincinnati Pops Orchestra, and the Boston Pops Orchestra, and has graced the stages of the Hippodrome Theater, Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, Strathmore Mansion, and the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Jones received her Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and her Master of Music in Piano Accompanying at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. After graduation, she chose to pursue a professional vocal career with the Social Soldiers Chorus of the U.S. Army Field Band, where she served for six years. Now a civilian, Jones maintains an active performing schedule in the Baltimore, D.C. area and teaches jazz and commercial voice at Towson University and directs the Towson Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Let's get Sarah up on the screen. And we will ask her to unmute. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, it's so great to see you all again. Happy first day of October, right? Is it first October? Yeah, it is. <laughs> anyway, it's great to bring in the season of pumpkins and uh, scary stories with the noir at the bar. So thank you so much, Randy and Haley, for having me today. Uh, uh, Randy has picked out some cool tunes for me to do. I love it when people give me the set list. I don't even have to think about it. Uh, he, the first tune that I will do is called Exactly Like You. And it was written by Jimmy McHugh and Dorothy Fields, the great songwriting duo. They wrote lots of songs together um, in the early 1930s. And they also wrote On the Sunny Side of the Street. Uh, and uh, I Can't Give You Anything But Love. Incidentally, this song came from a musical that totally flopped but they came with on the sunny side of the street and exactly like you so two famous songs so the show must not have been that bad so anyway here it is Each night for someone exactly like you. Why should we spend money on a show or two? No one does those love scenes exactly like you. You make me feel so grand. I want to hand the world to you. You seem to understand each foolish little scheme I'm scheming, dream I'm dreaming. Now I know why mother taught me to be true. She meant me for someone exactly like you. I know why I've waited, I know why I've been blue. Prayed each night for someone exactly like you. Why should we spend money on a show or two? No one does those love scenes exactly like you. You make me feel so grand. I want to hand the world to you. You seem to understand each foolish little scheme I'm scheming, dream I'm dreaming. Now I know why mother taught me to be true. She meant me for someone exactly like you. 
exactly like you exactly like you exactly like you awesome thank you so much sarah that was thank great you. I feel like I should be playing the claps when everybody's done anyway. Well, I can see them, so I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All righty. So our next reading comes from Samantha Downing. Samantha currently lives in New Orleans, where she's furiously typing away at her next thrilling novel. Her newest book, For Your Own Good, stars one private school instructor who is teaching his students all the wrong lessons. Robert Downey Jr. and Greg Berlanti are developing the novel for HBO Max. Let's get Samantha up on the screen. Hello. <laughs> Starting with chapter one. Entitlement has a particular stench, pungent, bitter, almost brutal. Teddy smells it coming. The stench blows in the door with James Ward. It oozes out of his pores, infecting his suit, his polished shoes, his ridiculously white teeth. I apologize for being late, James says, offering his hand. It's fine, Teddy says. Not all of us can be punctual. The smile on James's face disappears. Sometimes it can't be helped. Of course. James sits at one of the student desks. Normally, Teddy would sit right next to a parent, but this time he sits at his own desk at the front of the class. His chair is angled slightly, giving James a clear view of the award hanging on the wall. Teddy's Teacher of the Year plaque came in last week. You said you wanted to talk about Zach, Teddy says. I want to discuss his midterm paper. Zach's paper sits on Teddy's desk. Daisy Buchanan from The Great Gatsby. Was she worth it? along with Teddy's rubric assessment. He glances up at James, whose expression doesn't change. An interesting topic. You gave him a B plus. Yes, I did. James smiles just enough. Teddy, not Mr. Crutcher, as everyone else calls him, and not Theodore, just Teddy, like they are friends. You know how important junior grades are for college. I do. Zach is a straight A student. I understand that. I read his paper, James says, leaning back a little in his chair, settling in for the long argument. I thought it was well written and it showed a great deal of creativity. Zach worked very hard to come up with a topic that hadn't been done before. He really wanted a different perspective on a book that's been written about ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. The words hang in the air, swinging like a pendulum. All true, Teddy says, but you still gave him a B plus. Zach wrote a good paper and good papers get a B. Exceptional papers get an A. Teddy picks up the rubric and holds it out to James. You can see the breakdown for yourself. Grammar, structure, mechanics, it's all here. James has to get up to retrieve the paper, which makes Teddy smile. He folds his hands and watches. As James starts to read, his phone buzzes. He takes it out and holds up a finger, telling Teddy to wait, then gets up and walks out of the classroom to take the call. Teddy is left alone to think about his time, which is being wasted. James asked for this meeting. James specified that it had to be after hours in the evening. This is what Teddy has to deal with from parents, and he deals with it ad infinitum. He stares at his own phone, counting the minutes as they pass wondering what James would do if he just got up, walked past him, and left. It's unfortunate that he can't. If Teddy walks out, James will call the headmaster and complain. The headmaster will then call Teddy and remind him that parents pay the bills, including his own paycheck. Belmont is not a public school. Not that he would get fired. Just six months ago, he was named Teacher of the Year, for God's sake. But it would be a headache, and he doesn't need that. Not now. So he stays counting the minutes, staring at the walls. The room is orderly, sparse. Teddy's desk is clear of everything except Zach's paper, a pen, and a laptop. No inspirational posters on the wall, no calendars, nothing but Teddy's recent award. Belmont Academy is an old school with dark paneling, solid doors, and original wood floors. 
The only modern addition is the stack of cubby holes near the door. That's where the students have to leave their phones during class, an idea Teddy fought for until the board approved it. Now the other teachers thank him for it. Before the cubbies were installed, kids used their phone throughout class. Once, several years ago, Teddy broke a student's phone. That was an expensive lesson. Five minutes have passed since James walked out. Teddy starts to pick at his cuticles. It's a habit he developed back in high school, though over the years he got rid of it. Last summer, he started doing it again. Time continues to pass. If Teddy had a dollar for every minute he was kept waiting by James and every other parent, he wouldn't be teaching. He wouldn't have to do anything at all. 11 minutes go by before James walks back into the room. I apologize, I was waiting for that call. It's fine, Teddy says, some people just can't disconnect. Sometimes it's not possible. Of course. James takes his seat at the desk and says, let me just ask you straight out. Is there anything we can do about Zach's paper? When you say do, Mr. Ward, are you asking me if I'll change his grade? Well, I thought it was an A paper. A minus maybe, but still an A. I understand that, and I understand your, Zach, your concern for Zach and his future. However, can you imagine what would happen if I changed his grade? Can you appreciate how unfair that would be, not only to the other students, but also to the school? If we started basing our grades based on, started basing our grades on what parents think they should be instead of teachers, how can we possibly know if we're doing our job? We couldn't know if our students were learning the material and progressing with their education. And that, Mr. Ward, is the very foundation of Belmont. Teddy pauses, taking great joy at the dismayed look on James's face. It's not so arrogant now. So no, I will not change your son's grade and threaten the integrity of this school. The silence in the room is broken only by the clock. The minute hand jumps forward with a loud click. James clears his throat. I apologize, I didn't mean to suggest anything like that. Apology accepted. But James isn't done yet. They never are. Perhaps there is some extra work Zach can do, even if he has to read a second book and write another paper. Teddy thinks about this while staring down at his hands. The cuticle on his index finger already looks ragged and it's only the middle of the term. Perhaps he says, finally says, let me give it some thought. That's all I ask. I appreciate it. So does Zach. Zach is a smug little bastard who has no appreciation for anything or anyone except himself. That's why he didn't get an A. His paper was good, damn good in fact. If Zach were a better person, he would have received a better grade. Thank you. Thanks so much, Samantha. That was great. All righty, so reading next is Haley Moon. Haley is an Alabama native and a self-described crazy cat lady in training. She has had two of her poems, Damaged Wings and Untitled, published in her alma mater's literally, literary magazine, The Filibuster, during her freshman and junior years at the University of Auburn at Montgomery. When she's not making drugs from eight to five, the FDA regulated ones, blogging on social issues or crocheting to stay sane, she's out seeking inspiration in the macabre. And with that, I'll put Haley up on the screen. All right, um, so I'm just gonna read a little bit from a manuscript that I'm working on. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. The touch sweeping the hair off my shoulder was soft, almost sensual. The eight shots of Patron I had taken on a dare didn't allow me to move nor open my eyes. A sound of displeasure left my lips, but somehow I managed to speak. Uh, Melissa, stop. We've talked about this. It's creepy when you do stuff like this. The touch stopped. I listened, holding my breath as the footsteps grew faint. I breathed out relieved and slightly fearful that I had offended her. Her bedroom door closed with a thud and classical music could be heard playing faintly. I wondered when did she start listening to Mozart, but I only entertained the thought briefly before my mind went blank and faded out. The following morning I smelled bacon and I sat up quickly, 
only to collapse back onto the satin pillow. My cell rang and I moaned, agitated. When the hell did she start eating bacon? The question crossed my mind as I rolled over and snatched up the offending object. I sighed, hello? Girl, why are you so dry on the phone? Damn, if I knew you were going to be all anti, I wouldn't have called. I'm sorry, Diane, I've got a hangover. I sat up again, but this time much slower. She's been acting weird. I placed my hand over my forehead and glanced at the TARDIS alarm clock. Well, you're not as young as you used to be. You going to class today? Nope. Oh, okay. So you're going to miss your midterm. I rolled my eyes and swung my legs over the side of the bed. Nope. I'm getting ready as we speak. Diane chuckled. <laughs> Liar. So what's new with the roommate? Like I said, she's just being weird, you know? When is she not being a total weirdo? Has she taken the Black Dahlia crime scene photos down yet? I stood wobbling. Quickly, I regained my balance and walked over to my private bedroom, bathroom. No, but we've met in the middle, so to speak. As long as she keeps them in her room and keeps the door closed, we're good. Looking at my reflection, I didn't know where to begin and opted for sitting on the toilet. I cradled my hand with my free head. I cradled my head with my free hand. Diane sighed. She's cooking breakfast, I whispered. Really? Yeah, and I smell bacon. She laughed and I had to pull the phone away from my ear slightly. So I thought she was a vegan or something. She continued laughing. She was caressing my hair last night. Diane stopped and I could almost hear her gnawing on her bottom lip. Cam, all joking aside, it may be time to move out. She's not that bad, you know? And she and I talked and the sentence died on my lips as I looked up to find to see Melissa, Melissa's reflection in the full length mirror. Her body was angled in the doorway, more toward the bedroom with her head just turned just enough for me to see that she was staring at me. The eyes were dark brown, but Melissa's are blue. I shook off the oddity, thinking she was wearing contacts. She did shit like that. Her skin was paler than usual, and I could see bandages around her neck and wrists. I ran my eyes over her form and took in how the skin of her legs were pulled. I wondered if she was ashy. Her hair was full and shinier than I had ever seen it. It looked good, and I smiled up at her, hoping she didn't hear what I had said to Diane. I have to go. She's around, isn't she? Yeah, I'll see you later. I whispered and quickly hung up the phone. Melissa, about last night, I know you were trying to help. I, we've talked about this before, okay? There was no reaction or movement for what felt like minutes. And then she raised her hand and beckoned me to come. At lightning speed, she left the room. And before I could get to the hallway, Melissa had disappeared behind the door to her bedroom. I heard it lock as I stopped a few feet from it. I rolled my eyes. Maybe it was time to move out. I headed toward the kitchen and saw the table set for one. I sat and ate quickly, gulping down the orange juice. It felt like hours, or maybe it was just a few minutes. I couldn't tell anymore as the cabinets and window merged into one. I tried to stand, but my legs felt like jello and I was only able to rise about an inch off my chair before my bottom collided with it. Involuntarily, I started to rock side to side and I look up to find Melissa next to me. I reached for her, but she stepped back, letting me fall to the floor. Next, I feel something sharp, followed by wetness on my cheek. Everything fades into black. As Detective Weber came in, clutching a manila file folder, I slapped my hands against the table hard, causing it to rock slightly. I didn't do this. I didn't kill Melissa. I shouted, hoping my passion would exonerate me. He held up his hand, sitting down and placing the file on the table. Yeah, we know. He sounded bored. Then why am I still here? We have questions and more information about your roommate. I folded my hands and nodded, waiting for him to continue. Do you have anywhere to stay? You know, aside from the apartment. Yes. Good. But what's wrong with my apartment? Why can't I go back? I started to panic. 
We found Melissa dead in her bedroom. He paused as he continued watching me. I couldn't help but let my hand fly to my mouth. That's not possible. I saw her the other day. She was fine. She cooked breakfast. No, your roommate. He opened the file, revealing the photos. I couldn't tell who the person was, but I knew from the pictures on the wall that it was Melissa's room. Has been dead for over a week. When we searched the apartment, that is how we found her. Cause of death is shock, possibly from being flayed. He looked up near my hairline. I guess that's what the killer was going to do to you. I brought my hand up and felt the bandage. Quickly, I withdrew it, confused. I don't remember this. I pointed to my head. And you won't. When we asked for a hair sample, hair sample, we ran it. You came back positive for gamma hydroxybutyric acid. What the fuck is that? It's a date rape drug. And it's for seeing your roommate. And that was probably, probably the killer in Melissa's skin. What? I felt bile, bile, bile rise in the back of my throat. All righty, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Haley. Lots of reactions in the videos to that story. I like it. All righty, so next up, we'll enjoy another performance by Sarah Jones. I don't know how to sing after that. <laughs> Wow, that was amazing. That last bit, my face was like, oh. <laughs> wow. That was awesome, Haley. Okay, so <laughs> uh, the uh, next tune that I will do uh, uh, is called At Last. So it's super, super famous. Um, of course, it was, everybody recognizes it as the uh, seminal recording by Etta James, but it's been recorded by hundreds of people, like from Nat King Cole to Celine Dion to Beyonce. So it's a wonderful tune. Except that last roommate is not going to last. Oh my gosh, that was really something. <laughs> like a song at last the skies above are blue my heart was wrapped in clover The night I'd look at you I found a dream That I could speak to A dream that I Could call my own I found a thrill to press my cheek to a thrill I've never known you smiled and then the spell was cast and here we are in heaven for you are mine at last I 
had found a dream that I can speak to, a dream that I can call my own. I found the thrill to press my cheek to, a thrill I've never known. You smiled, and then the spell was cast. And here we are in Thank Amazing. you so much. Thank you Thank so much, you. Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That song. I'm enjoying all of these stories. This is amazing. So thank you. All right, everyone. We have moved on to our second raffle of the evening. So we're going to bring up the magic hat again, and we're going to pull three more names. Nikki Dawson, awesome. Congratulations, Nikki. All right. Next up, M. Ravenel. I want to know what M stands for. Very mysterious. Maybe it stands for mysterious. All righty. And our last winner of the evening. Kim Umbria, congratulations to all of our winners. I will send you over a link to give us your information for your raffle prizes. All righty. Our next author to take the stage is Rebecca Forster. Rebecca started writing On a Crazy Dare. Now, more than 40 books later, she's a USA Today and Amazon bestselling thriller office author. I don't know why I wanted to say officer, a thriller officer. Her Josie Bates thrillers, the eight book witness series have had more than 3 million downloads. Her latest Finn O'Brien thrillers have captured the imagination of readers who love gritty crime. Rebecca enrolled in the rigorous DEA and ATF Citizens Academies, has been accepted at the Homeland Security Academy, done weapons training at Southwest Academies, and is an avid court watcher. She's an active researcher in order to pen thrillers that immerse the reader in the real world of crime and justice. She's married to a superior court judge and lives in Los Angeles. Let's have Rebecca up on the screen. Here we go. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. I'm so happy to be back again. Um, I'm gonna be reading from Before Her Eyes, which is a um, standalone novel and the book of my heart. It doesn't take place in LA, but in the uh, forest between uh, California and Oregon. So I'll jump right into it. Dove Conley's bedroom, 2.17 AM. Dove Conley caught up the phone on the first ring, though it was set so low as to make the sound virtually mute. Any other human being in a deep sleep wouldn't have heard it, but Dove wasn't anyone else. First, he didn't sleep all that deep anymore. Then there was the thing he had in him. It was his sixth sense that let him hear and see what others didn't, anticipate what others couldn't. Most people respected his talent. Some thanked God for it, and others, who weren't so law-abiding, steered clear of it. His wife, Cherie, would swear that she would be forever faithful because he would know her intentions even before she strayed. But that was before the unthinkable happened. Now, if Cherie spoke of that sixth sense at all, she did so with regret, sad that the gift had forsaken Dove when they needed it most. Tonight, Dove's wife didn't move when he pushed aside the covers and got out of bed. He put the phone to his ear, padding along to the kitchen in bare feet wearing only old sweatpants. 
What is it, Jessica? Hogan boys tearing up the tavern again? He kept his voice low. The house wasn't big. Jessica Taylor started to speak, but all Dove heard was the news catching in her throat. Talk to me, Jessica. Oh God, it's a bad and bad as anything. The woman pulled in a breath and it went no further than the middle of her chest. What and where? One of ours, Dove, Patty Johnson was driving home, saw the lights at the mountain store and figured Fritz was hosting one of his poker parties like he used to. Jessica breathed deep again, and this time it went all the way into her gut. Patty stopped into the store thinking to pick up a hand, Dove. He went to the store and found Fritz dead, head splattered all over the back room. I'm so sorry. Ah, oh, Jesus. Dove put a hand to his face. There no, were, were no words to express his shock and sorrow. They were talking about Fritz, a jack-o'-lantern of a man, solid, round, possessed of a smile that cracked his face in two and lit up even in the darkest times. Now Fritz was gone and Dove was shamed. He slept through the man's dying. That he didn't feel his friend's need was as close to a sin as anything he could imagine. There would come a time for personal reckoning. The time wasn't now. Now was the time for Dove to do his job. Where's Patty, he asked flatly. Says he's sitting in his truck waiting on you. He called from the store, but he didn't want to stay inside. There was a beat before Jessica asked, want me to let the state boys know? Give them a call, but I'm not waiting on them, Jesse. All right, Dove, ring up Tim and get him out there. Call Nathan too. You gonna trust Nathan with this, Jessica asked. I trust him, Jesse, you make the call. And Bernadette, we've got to let Bernadette know. I'll see to it, Dove, Jessica offered, but he had already changed his mind. Never mind, not yet. I'll go to the store first. There's always a chance Patty is wrong. Dove clutched for something that would make this better. The straw he came up with was speculation. It was a short one, a ridiculous dodge, but it was what he had. Besides, if Bernadette's awake, she'll know something's gone down. Can't be as close as those two have been all these years and not know. Jessica murmured something Dove couldn't quite catch. It sounded like hallelujah. He was about to ring off when she stopped him. Dove, you think he could have done this to himself? I mean, it's been hard on him with Bernadette and all. No, Fritz wouldn't have left us with that on our mind. You're right, Jessica agreed. You just do what you gotta do, Dove. I'll be by the phone ready to help with whatever you need. Jesse? Yep. Lock your doors. Keep your eyes open. Is your gun loaded? Dove, whoever did this is probably long gone. Besides, I can take care. You do it, Jessica, Dove said. One friend gone is enough. I won't have another. He rang off. He kept his thoughts so close there wasn't room for his huge sorrow. Dove dressed in the near dark the small light in the bathroom casting only the faintest glow. Cherie saw that his uniform was laundered good as any city cop. She reasoned that if Dove's size didn't make people think twice before coming down on him, his starched and pressed uniform would. Even in these big mountains where so much law was made just by two people meeting up together, a fine uniform made a difference. Dove put his gun in his holster and his jacket on over that. He slipped his knife into its sheath and took his hat off the peg. It was only when he went to kiss his sleeping wife that he paused. Sherry was a powerful draw, and it used to be he couldn't be in the same room without wanting to touch her. Yet her brow was furrowed as she struggled inside her dreams, and it caught him up short. Those dreams were a place Dove didn't want to go. He couldn't help even if he got there, so he reached out and put a hand on her head. It didn't ease her worry. It was a bad night all around. Dove stepped back, but the bassinet was in his way and he was forced to look at the baby. The girl's eyes were open, big eyes still blue from birth, even though four months had passed. He prayed they would change dark like his and Cherie's. Maybe if her eyes changed, everything else would too. But she looked up at those blue eyes without seeing him. Dove turned away as if he couldn't see her. One of the cats stretched when he took the keys to the car. Its yellow eyes followed him as he stepped into the small room off the kitchen. A basket of cleanly folded laundry sat atop the washer. It smelled of baby powder and pink cream. The scent made Dove gag. 
but it didn't stop him from staying long enough to check the security control panel. The lights were lit green, each window and door of his house wired so that an alarm would sound at Jessica's should anyone open them without a code. The indicators for the alarm pads that were buried around the perimeter of the property pulsed red. Finally, Dove fl flipped on the floodlights ringing his cabin home. That done, he retraced his steps and opened the back door. Outside, he saw his breath and gave the black dog no more than a glance as he walked by. The creature was all muscle, pointed ears and snout. He had teeth that could rip a man to shreds. Dove swung himself into his car, fired up the engine, switched on the headlights and headed out. It was 2.35 in the morning. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thank you. All righty. So our final reader for this evening is John McMahon. The New York Times called John McMahon's debut novel, The Good Detective, pretty much perfect and listed it among their top 10 crime novels for 2019. The book was a finalist for the Edgar Award for Best First Novel, a finalist for ITW's Best First Award, and a finalist for Best Novel by the Southern California Independent Booksellers Association. His follow-up, The Evil Men Do, was also a New York Times top 10 crime novel for 2020. His third novel, A Good Kill, was an Amazon editor's pick for June. John's series is Southern Noir and is set in Mason Falls, Georgia. They feature detectives P.T. Marsh and Remy Morgan. John lives in Southern California with his wife, two teenagers, and two rescue animals. In his day job, he's an advertising creative director who's written a Super Bowl spot for Alfa Romeo and won a Gold Clio for Fiat. John will be reading from his most recent novel, A Good Kill, which was released earlier this year in June. Let's get John up on the screen. All right, so starting right from the beginning. One, in times of reflection, I find that my chosen profession isn't one that I'd recommend to others. Homicide is a lonely division in a police department filled with a particular type of person as comfortable with the dead as with the living and often able to suppress their emotions in ways that cannot be healthy. My partner, Remy Morgan, had arrived at Falls Magnet Middle School about 20 minutes before me, was hunkered down behind one of six patrol cars that littered the school's front lawn. I grabbed the Remington 870P from a patrolman and ran in a crouched position, the shotgun clasped under my right arm. I dropped behind the black and white where Remy was. One gunman, my partner catch, said, catching me up. Three students and two teachers hostage. One of the teachers is injured. I borrowed Remy's binoculars placing the Bushnell L series to my face. The hostages are in the art room, PT, she said. Back of the building, far right. I scanned the school grounds. To the right of the main building was a rectangular sports field, currently dressed for football, <coughs> currently dressed for football and not a soul on it. To the left was a concrete area with a cluster of orange metal lunch tables. Backpacks and Coke cans lay abandoned on the ground. There's something else, Remy said. Ava Senza is one of the three girls inside. I pulled the binoculars down. Ava Senza was a budding 13-year-old artist who attended the Magnet School. She was also the daughter of our boss, police chief Dana Senza. Bullshit, I said, but Remy's face was dead serious. My partner wore gray Kevlar over a white blouse and tan pants. The outfit contrasted with her dark brown skin. Vest, she said to me, tapping at her own protection. I grabbed mine, pulled the straps tight around my chest. The first report came in at 1.57, Remy said. A student saw a man in the art room with a gun, pulled the fire alarm. From there, whispers and texts moved through the school faster than summer lightning. Kids streamed in the nearby forest, Remy explained, flooded into adjoining neighborhoods. I turned and re-examined the campus. Falls Magnet Middle School was only two years old, built on land that the locals once called the Sullivan Farm. When I was a kid, I'd ridden my dirt bike here with friends. A six foot long frog gig, duct taped to the handlebars, the metal pole of the tool sticking up in the air. I leaned on the butt of the Remington. You got an ID on the weapon ram, so we know what we're up against? Remy turned to a patrolman, crouched just the other side of her. My partner had the sharp cheekbones of a fashion model, and her long hair was flat ironed and cut an angle at her shoulders. The students who ran out of the school, she said to the rookie, you got them in a safe area in the parking lot? Maybe half them, Detective Morgan, he said. We've been releasing them to parents. Find me the boy who saw the gun. The patrolman took off, sprinting out of the area in a crouched position. 
My name is P.T. Marsh, and Mason Falls, Georgia is my town. Lately, we've topped out at around 130,000 souls, so we're not so big there's more than two Walmarts in town. Then again, we're not so tiny that it won't make national news when a school shooting happens. In the distance, 100 feet behind us, a white pop-up tent had been erected by patrol. Further back, in the visitor's parking lot, a CNN van was unloading camera equipment. Patrol called the cell numbers of both teachers held in the school, Remy said. No answer. And Chief Senza? Probably 20 minutes out, Remy said. Protocol is clear though, PT. Talk the shooter down, make sure no one else gets injured or worse. I studied Remy's face. You remember a dare talk we did here last year? She shook her head. The kids weren't paying attention, so the teacher took the class outside? Yeah, Remy nodded. I motioned over the top of the building where the shooter was. Those pine trees curve around back. There's a maintenance shed tucked under a hedge of ironwood. What are you thinking, Remy asked. I'm going to circle back there, I said. See if I can get a different angle on this guy. Maybe climb up on the roof of that shed. I grabbed the Remington. You got your walkie, Remy asked. I looked down. It was clipped to my belt. And my cell in case you want to stay off the radio. If you get the shot, I thought we were trying to talk him down, I said. We are, she said. But if conditions change and you get a good look. Remy hesitated, her eyes searching mine. You want me to go instead, she asked. I took off without answering, making a beeline back toward the forested area that ran between the school, State Route 903. Four months ago, I'd had a guy in the sights of my gun, a killer who'd taken out a dozen innocents. I'd pulled the trigger and missed, then missed again. If my partner hadn't been there, I'd be dead now, hence her question. I dodged around thick rows of sugar maple, the silver gray bark of the trees five or six from each other. Above me, their green and brown flowers hung in clusters. In the world of policing against an active shooter, there's pre-99 and post. Before the 99 shooting at Columbine, the response to shooters at schools was always the same. Talk the gunman down, call in SWAT, and wait. Post Columbine, all the rules changed. Go in hard and fast, and if need be, kill the shooter before he can hurt any kids. But when a gunman takes hostages, all bets are off and patience is needed. Prayer doesn't hurt either. Sweat was building up under Kevlar, and my walkie chirped. We just heard something from the media, Remy's voice squawked. As I glanced back, I saw a SWAT man pulling in. What have you got, I asked. A student talked to CNN. Apparently he saw the car the gunman came out of. A reporter ran the plates. Jesus, I thought, already playing catch up to the media? The gunman's name is Jed Harrington, Remy said. He's 36, a local. I glanced through branch, branches of wood fern back at the parking lot. Cars were backing up on the highway, parents arriving, panic setting in. Did someone pull his jacket? He's got no record, PT Remy said. Stay tuned, I'll find out more. Reclipping the walkie, I hustled for another hundred yards, found the maintenance shed and moved around the back, scrambled up onto the air conditioning unit. From atop the AC, I pulled myself onto the roof and scooched my six foot two inch frame to the edge, my stomach flat on the surface. At a hundred feet, I could see an eight by 10 window that looked out from the art room onto the back lawn. I put the binocs to my face and the art space came in clear. Students' paintings covered every wall. Floor black, black industrial work tables were spread throughout. I scanned left, three students, all girls, 12 or 13 in white blouses and plaid skirts. The shooter was white and stood near the window his body half blocked by the teacher, a brunette in her thirties. My cell buzzed and I slid it close to my ear. I was lying prone on my stomach with a shotgun in front of me. You're not gonna believe what I can see from up here, I said to Remy. No sound came back at first, and I glanced at the screen. The number was blocked. Good afternoon, Detective Marsh, a man's voice came back. Shit, a voice I knew. The man on the other end was the highest ranking public official in the state of Georgia, a man named Toby Monroe. Governor Monroe to folks who saw him on the news or punched his name at the ballot box. You're at this scene, Monroe said, the one I'm watching on TV. I am. Thank God, Monroe said, someone I can trust. But the governor and I didn't have a trusting relationship. Ours was which one, ours was one in which favors were traded, and I was in arrears, owing him a big one. I'd read yesterday that Monroe was only one point, one point ahead in the polls. If the school shooting went bad, he might behal, fall behind by 10 points. I braced myself for impact. What is it you want, I said. That's, that's the end of that section. Awesome, thanks so much, John. All right, I didn't get to play the claps, so I'm gonna play the claps for everybody now. So we get claps for everybody who read tonight and everybody who performed tonight. You all did awesome. All right, that's my little fun for this evening. 
Thank you guys so much for joining us. That is the end of our reading program for this evening. Thank you to Randy and Haley for organizing this event and to all of our awesome authors who joined us to read this evening. Thank you to Sarah for performing. Thank you to Alex of Host My Zoom for bringing us all together. Um, with that, our evening ends. I'm going to put on some music and you're welcome to hang out for a little bit, but we're so glad that you joined us. <clears throat> and make sure to watch your emails or join us on Facebook to find future Noir at the Bar online events. Thanks, guys. Have a great evening. Dun, 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 dun.